the Islamic community. I said the church talks about, you can talk about the sense of church being the entire collective of Christians. The Ummah is the entire collection of Muslims. The Ummah is the Islamic community. Muslims often conceive of the world in different ways. And there are different traditions, which I'm going to get to in a moment. There's the community, which is the people, and then there are the places under the dominion of Islam. Let me also make some distinctions here between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, too. In Judaism, how do you become a Jew? If you want to become a if you want to become a Jew right now, what do you what do you do? You convert, yes. If you're a male, you'll be circumcised. You'll be entered into the. This is a process called proselytization. You become a Jew. When formerly you were some kind of a goyim, an unbeliever of some kind, or at least a non-Jew, Gentile. If you want to become a Christian, what do you do? Are you born a Christian? You might be born into a Christian family, born into a Jewish family. If you want to become a Christian, what do you do? Confess. I confess with my mouth. I, I believe, and there are different traditions here. You might be baptized, you might be confirmed, both. But then you're brought into the covenant community, and you're considered a part of it, but you're converted into it. There it might be, oh, you've accepted, you've accepted the gospel of Christ, or there you're a covenant child in Christ, or that be your baptized, so that might be Plato baptists you're baptized in the community, you're already kind of considered in, and then later that'll be confirmed. Or you might be someone. No, I'm gonna. I'm going to. I'm gonna be baptized when I admit myself a cradle Baptist. But then you can. You become a Christian, right? Islam. This works differently. In Islam, everybody is born a Muslim. If you're like, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not. You were. What happened? So either you're not converts. You don't convert to Islam. You revert to Islam. Everybody is born a Muslim. Well, what happened? Why am I not a Muslim then now? Because of all the lies you've been told your whole life. Now, that, whether you are a Christian, a Jew, an atheist, a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Taoist, a Confucian, a Shintoist, whatever it is you are, if you're not a Muslim, you're not a Muslim because someone told you the wrong things. Someone has corrupted your mind. So really, a conversion in Islam, the, the idea even is, the whole world then is actually Islamic. And places where Islam is not in the majority, it's because people there are misleading people and telling them things that are false. And so really, in Islam there's this idea that we have to restore the totality of things that are, we have to restore it to the way, things, the way it ought to be. Everyone really is a Muslim, and if they've been led away by jihiliya, ignorance, and tarif corruption. It's our duty to rectify this. Because that, that means we're otherwise we're allowing people to speak ill of Allah. It's gotta be fixed. So the world can be thought of really in three ways then. So let's talk about the first one. What's the Dar al Islam? Literally, the, the dominion of the Islam, the dominion of submission. These are the places on the map that probably look green. They probably have Islamic government. Islam is in the majority there. You know Islam is happening there. Whereas, what do we have in the Dar al Haram? That's the notion of those are areas where that's not the case. Where Islam is not in the majority. Not not just in terms of numbers, but that's... I mean, hypothetically, you could have a place that was, you know, 99% Muslim citizens. If there's not a government in place that is reflect, reflecting some sort of Islamic principles, that's not Islamic. That's not part of the Dar al Islam. That's why Turkey is so controversial today as a country, too. Because you, this might surprise some of you, but uh, what happened after World War I? There was an Ottoman Empire that broke apart. But we have um, Ataturk, who was a Turkish reformer, that said Turkey is no longer an Islamic country. We are, we are a secular state. We are not part of the Dar al Islam. We are Turkey looking to impress Europe. So even today, Turkey is technically not an Islamic... Yeah, yeah. are the majority of people living there Muslims? Yes. Does it have an Islamic government? No. At least according to its constitution. Which it has. Now some have argued that Turkey throughout certain periods, and maybe even under its current ruler, Erdogan, is trying to kind of go back to this. 
but that's part of the controversy. All right. It's Dar al Islam if someone is, we have Islamic rulers. What's the Dal al Harab then? Places that are in conflict. Not necessarily armed conflict, just places where that place isn't Muslim yet. But there are, mu- there are Muslim brothers and sisters living there. Okay, so the Ummah is there, even if the place is not Islamic. So you could argue that really that's Turkey. But also that might be places like the United States or the United Kingdom. Muslims are there, so part of the Islamic community is there, even though the United States and the United Kingdom are not Muslim countries. And then I mentioned this third controversial term. That's, this is one that you see in certain views of Islam, but not all. So, I mean, this is what I've said so far is analogous to things that you know Christians might have, where they say, these are the places that are majority Christian, these are the places where we need more missionaries. The idea is the same. These are places that are majority Christian, these are places where the gospel is not spread yet, just in, in Islamic form. The focus that's different, I suppose, is that Islam pr- places a great stress on how really things like the state is organized in those places. It's not just it's not just do we have people on the ground there talking about Islam like missionaries. It's that is this place Islamicized because remember Islam is not merely just something that we do. It's not merely an activity that we do once a week. Religion is not seen in Islam as something that's compartmentalized. It's all of life, and so if there's something like the government that's not doing Islamic things, then that thing that's been cut off, that's not involved in Islam, that's wrong. Because Islam involves all of life, not just part of it. But I say this is controversial because it's that Wahhabi school of Islam, I've mentioned that multiple times, I'm going to explain that in a moment, that sees places that are not in Muslim majority as the Dar al-Kufr. What's Kufr? A kafir. That's the, that's the Arabic word for infidel. Kafir. The area of infidels or the area of unbelief. What does infidel mean? Literally, it's from the Latin for unfaithful. So this is the land of the faithless. What's that? Well, that's the the hardcore take on the places that are not Islamicized, though that's enemy territory. So that's not the, that is not the majority Muslim position, but I said that's the position of Wahhabi Islam, or the Wahhabi, <laughs> the Wahhabi take on Islam. Now, this is where this word comes into play. It's something that the Hadith talks about and the Quran is this notion of jihad. What's well, a jihad? Literally, it refer it, the word just means struggle or like or like conflict, uh, like not quite like like dealing with something. And it always refers in the Quran to struggle on behalf of the ummah. Struggle on behalf of the Islamic community. Struggle in what way? Well, there are different ways that it's talked about. Sometimes it can mean an internal struggle. Like, I'm trying to get myself right, myself in alignment, to follow the Sharia, to do what Allah wants me to do. That's jihad. I'm going to make myself right. I'm going to get myself together for the sake of my Muslim brothers and sisters. That's jihad. There's also a sense in which jihad is any kind of struggling on behalf of the ummah, any kind whatsoever. So that could mean me talking about Allah to my co-workers, it being a, represent, a representative of Islam to those around me. That's jihad. Also, for those of the, Wahhab, of the Wahhabi take, that's committing violence to spread the ummah, to make that green greener on a map. And as we'll see here, that's not indicative of any majority sense of Islam. So let's take a look at this real quick. So what I have here on the screen right now is this is a taxonomy, that is a arborescent hierarchical chart, of different, you'll notice it says Muslim denominations. And it's kind of a misnomer. So these are all the different, these are the different, if the genera we're talking about here is Islam, these are the various species. Of course, the big ones here, are the Sunnis and the Kiers. They're, they're your Kalos, by the way. You'll notice Ali's over here. We'll get to that. The Shia are over there. And so you've got all these different things. And what you see here are some of these. So Sunnis and Shias, I think most know. There's all these words which I'm sure most of you haven't heard before. Maliki. 
Maybe the name Malik is the king. Shafi, anybody? Yeah, if you're shaking your head, like, you're good. That's my point. Like, we don't really know these subdivisions too much. It also says where they are. Okay, so some of them. Like, so obviously this one here, this is a Shia one you'll see in around. And these are different takes on the Sharia. So these are various schools of Islamic interpretation. It also gives you the numbers of how much this represents, is the 1%. Okay, where you can find them. So Nation of Islam, that's an American phenomenon. Uh, with uh, Emmanuel Muhammad. We're not going to talk about that one too much in here. Uh, here oh, Hanafi! That's really the, the Turkish take. Very open idea of Sharia. Okay? Traditional. Very open. Okay, a little bit black, like, really? Does it mean this? Whereas a strict take are ones like the Hanbali here. And specifically, this one. I've mentioned this word a couple times. The Wahhabi. What's the Wahhabi take? Pretty much, if it is a Sunni terrorist organization, I guarantee you it's up the Wahhabi school. So, let me do it. Al-Qaeda? Guess what interpretation of Islam they've got? Wahhabi. What's Al-Qaeda? Which is now currently the Daesh. The you ever heard of the Islamic State? ISIL, ISIS, Wahhabi. Which originally, the, ISIS and ISIL, that's the Islamic State in the Levant or the Islamic State in Syria. Originally, the uh, it was part of Al Qaeda, which was this organization that we were going to Wahhabize. The, the Islamic world. The Islamic world itself needs to convert to Islam. That's the idea. Because okay, they're not Islamic enough. Okay, so these are the these are the extremists that you think of. Okay, in of the Sunni tradition. So even uh, in parts of Africa too. Boko Haram in Nigeria. What's Boko Haram? Literally it means an Arab it is forbidden. So they'll show up at you know schools that have women. Islamic schools for women and show up and be like, you women can't learn. Why? Because the Quran forbids it. It doesn't. But it, we say it does, based on our take. The Taliban in Afghanistan. Wow. That's for, for suit, like strict Sunni. Everybody's going to wear it, will appear in this way. So that's the. That you see there. Right? There's Shia schools that are different too. Like if you look at pictures of uh, Tehran in the 70s, before the, before the Islamic Revolution, women are dressed just like Westerners. It wasn't until. This is not Wahhabi, this is a Shia school takes over under the Ayatollah Khomeini that I never women well, it must be covered. That's something in a strict form of Islam. Completely covered for women. Not that's actually fairly recent. It's kind of like what I said about uh, Hasidic Judaism where that traditional appearance has actually not been around that long. And similar here. Okay, traditionally, I mean your majority Muslim opinion was here. Very well. So that's why I point this out. Now we're going to get into some more of the differences here in a minute. But I want to point this out here, just a couple of different schools. But those, those really strict, the ones that you might think of when, when, when even when you, unfortunately, people think of Islam, they're probably picturing that. Just the, how many of Muslims is this indicative of? Very few. Less than a percent. In terms of identity would be part of that Wahhabi school. So if you want to learn more about Wahhabi, you can look it on your own, but I at least want to introduce that to you. Here's a bunch of different schools of Islam. And when I say schools of Islam, this refers especially to the interpretation of Sharia. Like, how do we how do we do Islamic ethics? How do we do that? There it is. Okay. So for, for people in Wahhabi, jihad means no, we're going we're gonna to commit violence to spread the Ummah. That's not traditional Islam. And even we can certainly say Islam in the early centuries, under those early caliphs, under Muhammad even, in the early caliphs, did it spread by violence? We saw that green spread really quickly, right? Yeah. Inarguable. But then also, as you pointed out too, once it spread, there's like a cool down phase. And once, it, and once that cool down phase, that cool, that cool down phase is, if anything, very peaceful. Very peaceful after you get about to the ninth century, and that's when you see really the amazing Islamic intellectual achievements from about the ninth to the thirteenth centuries, really until there's an incursion on, you know, parts of that Ummah start shrinking. 
like Spain's gone and then the Mongols show up. So yeah, well, early on, I'm, <laughs> and the, <laughs> I think with the Christians, it's the opposite. Starts out very peaceful, then later there's violence. Okay, and that happens at various places in time. There's parts where it, the Buddhists are violent. You might not expect it. Okay, there's a, there is Buddhist terrorism against the Muslims. Or even a lot of the hostility between Pakistan and India is a hostility between Islam and Hinduism. Sometimes things are political. Not always, but sometimes they are. Let's go to Islamic ethics. A, a Westerner might look at this and go, oh, how insulting is this? Can you believe she's dressed like that? Go look at any magazine co cover in the West of a woman, and what are you probably going to see? Someone not wearing much, and it being celebrated, and them saying, really, if <laughs> you are the ones that have the outfit for women. Really, here, this is liberating. No one has to conform to those ideas of beauty and perfection. You can, it's just not every, you don't have to put it on display constantly. That's the idea behind it. Unless you're Wahhabi. Okay, the Wahhabi is, we do this because you've got to, or, or else. And Muhammad, in his farewell sermon, explicitly says, treat women well. And he says some other things in there, in various hadiths, where he's like, well, because they, you, because you, they belong to you and you need to take care of them. But he says, it is, it's one of the main things he talks about is women ought to be treated well in his farewell sermon. And what else does he say? Well, let's take a look at those Islamic ethics here. There's some things we could say. All of, remember, all of life is Islam. So really, everything is ethics. Everything. What you believe, what you say, what you do. So there are some things you should do, some things you shouldn't do. Remember, the extreme positions, some things halal, we'll talk about that when it comes to like meat, but halal just means something's allowed. Haram means you can't do something. And there's actually a scale al akam al khamsa. This right here, this five stuff. Here's the here's the five levels of things in ethics. Okay, something's wajib, you must do it. So pray five times a day. You got to do that. There's no, no except, oh, I don't really feel it. no that you must do. Period. Stuff that's recommended, mustahab, things that would be good for you to do, but you don't have to do. Be good for you, be, and then think, there's some things that are neutral. Move on. It doesn't matter. Should I eat this for lunch or that for lunch? As long as it's, as long as it's halal, it doesn't matter. Maybe you might be some, there might be things that are better for your health. Right? So that might be recommended. Makru, something, probably not the best idea. Maybe like smoking cigarettes. You know what? Probably not the best thing to do, even for your health as a creation of Allah. Probably not the best thing to do. It's not forbidden. But you shouldn't. And then there is haram, forbidden. Bring the alcohol? Nope. Usury? Nope. What's usury? Actually, it's old, uh, charging exorbitant interest. So these are the things, in fact, that's the scale. But really, the Quran, as I said over there on the right too, emphasizes really your character first before just actions. Like, oh, did you, it's not, oh, did I do this right thing? Did I do this right thing? Do you have the right character? And the notion of character is taqwa. Which means basically afraid, but like fearing God. Do you fear God? Not in the sense of will he punish me, but really the word means like this character. Like, do you start from a de default position of I'm going to do what Allah wants? Not, oh, what do I have to do to get done to get make Allah happy with me? I want to do what Allah wants because that's my starting point. That's who I am. So the disposition of character is more important than particular actions that need to be performed. But here are the specific things that Muhammad says in his farewell address, his final sermon before he dies in Mecca, the kutbatu iwada that he says here, and this is in the Hadith. And so all of Islamic ethics is drawn from the Quran and the Hadith in Syria. Right but these are the things that he emphasizes in his own speech in the Hadith. One, so again, not in the Quran, but in the Hadith, one. Blood vengeance, stop it. So doing things like Romeo and Juliet levels of Family quarrels were like, well, you killed my grandfather, and now I'm going to kill you. That guy, like, just goes on. Stop it. So stop family quarrels that go on for dynasties and dynasties. Stop it. Stop usury. That's exorbitant interest. Don't do it. Pretty much everywhere in the Middle Ages, that's a crime. Christians, Jews, Muslims. Usury, exorbitant interest. But right, hey, you know, hundred bucks. I'll give you hundred bucks. You just got to pay me back. Okay, it's not for you to pay me back. Where's my five hundred dollars? 
usually, student loans today, usually. The care of women. Again, I already mentioned that. He explicitly says, I demand you must take care of women. They deserve respect and general treatment. And then he says some other things in there that I think we would find objectionable today. If they disobey you, yeah, you can you know you can punish them but only a little bit. The esteem of the Quran. The Quran is the word of God. And also Muhammad emphasizes his own prophethood. Did I not come on behalf of Allah to tell you these things? So really all that stuff right there is the fundament, the percipia, the arche of Islamic ethics. So I'm gonna say some stuff about experts, like what's an Imam say some stuff about the differences between Sunni and Shia, and then I'm moving on to Hinduism. That's what we'll be doing on the Thursday stuff.